Better late than never. You can see the hashtag on our visual side. Hashtag we talk fantasy after dark. A late night here in the capital region. But nonetheless, we're giving you week three talk for fantasy football. And of course, we're recapping week two and more. Kyle Ray, Chet Davis, Tom Goslowski, guys with you. We're here. Guys, we're here. Even though it's late at night. Chet, you just got off television. But nonetheless, you made time for us, man. This is the best that I've ever looked on We Talk Fantasy. And, uh, is this our third year of doing this? Yes. Usually uh, I have a hat on. I'm in sweats, uh, in comfortable clothes. Uh, I'm still wearing pants. So that is an upgrade or a downgrade, however you want to look at it. But uh, we are here. We, we're doing whatever we can with our busy schedules to make sure we can help you guys win your fantasy matchups. We can complain together about how shitty our teams are. And we can rejoice that we love the sport of football. Kyle, you look good as well. You flashed a picture of you at a wedding recently. You were all suited up looking great. So you look good. Chat looked good. I, before we hit record, was walking around like Zeke Elliott with my shirt halfway up. People have heard that before at LeVac and I. That was not recorded. And all Chet could hear was me muttering college football Big Ten unders to myself. So get ready for Gaz on the go this week. Guys, I think you need to look a little bit closer at the photo that Kyle flashed because he was actually the one in the white wedding dress. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I know you didn't really understand from a distance what he was showing. That is Kyle with double D fake boobs and a white dress. Oh! Surprising me on my wedding day for the first look photos. It was classic. There it's I unbelievable. Was. All right, give me like a quick recap while I went down. So this is the uh, early afternoon, few hours before my wedding. Uh, the photographer comes up to where I was getting ready with the groomsmen. And she said, all right, Cameron's ready. My, my now wife is ready for first look photos. And I was like, I thought we weren't doing those. We were only going to do it if it was bad weather. And this is a beautiful day up in the Adirondacks. So I'm confused. But she goes, no, Cameron wants to do it. And I'm like, you know what? Happy wife, happy life. Let's do it. Man. So I drive down to the venue. There I am, nervous. She had told me if I didn't cry the first time I saw her, she would make me do it again. We would have to do the whole wedding again. <laughs> so I'm getting myself like in the zone, like I'm like pinching myself to make some tears form. And then uh, you know, the photographer's like, "All right, here she comes." And then here, right, so my back is turned to everything, and I feel this gentle hand reach out to my shoulder and i'm like what's up babe no response i'm like are you crying and i hear a the sniffling kyle deserves a freaking oscar for this performance because i turn around and there is kyle ray in a full white dress with his boobs stuffed with a shirt saying you married the wrong bitch <laughs> It was epic. I had no idea it was Kyle. Someone is going to steal this prank and use it at wedding after wedding after this. Oh. Kyle, was it originally your thought? Did you see this somewhere? Did someone put you up to it? This was all Cameron. All, all Cameron. She sent me a video of a, of a best man and everybody doing it. And she goes, will you please do this? And I said, of course. <laughs> It was amazing. It was so perfect. I wish it was an original idea, but of course, in the age of Instagram and TikTok, nothing's original anymore. But it was, I had no idea that it was going to happen. It was perfect. Don't worry. It is Cam's idea for sure. I will edit that in and make it seem like she just thought of it all by herself. Yeah, that's no problem. All the credit. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, before we got into this episode, we were kind of Quickly briefed about topics. Usually we talk about chat roulette, but because we've already got the after dark feel, I think that's enough of the sexual innuendos we need before I get to the Johnstone supply read, which I'll talk about that when we get to the mail bank. But let's go to some running back combos. I don't know who, Chet, I think you were the first who sent this text over in our mass text about what you were kind of looking for in this early two weeks of what's happened to the NFL with these running back combos when it comes to fantasy football. Well, yeah, because we love, we love to talk about the handcuffs in fantasy football, those guys that need to be rostered in every league if guys get injured and they become the workhorse on their team. But a few teams in the NFL, they're, they're becoming more than handcuffs. These guys are getting used a lot more. We have an extra game this season, so it feels like coaches are starting to split the load a little bit more because maybe guys won't be able to last all the way into the postseason and be fresh. We might see a 
a Todd Gurley situation where by the time the Rams got to that Super Bowl, Todd Gurley had nothing left. He had used it all. So with that in mind, I think it's interesting to look at with a two-week sample size, the teams that are going with the two-headed monster backfield and how these guys can be utilized in fantasy league. I think we can all agree 100% the best backfield in football for two, two running backs is Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt. Both of those guys, Nick Chubb, he's your RB1 no matter what. I think Kareem Hunt is a viable RB2. If you're in a 10-team league, maybe he's a flex. Uh, value goes up in PPR formats, half PPR, because he's going to get more receptions. But, I mean, that guy's a starter in half of the league. Like, if, if he goes on a different team, we saw what he did with, in the Kansas City Chiefs earlier in his career. So he's fantastic. The one that I want to get your guys' take on, um, and for me, this is my number two for, again, the best duo backfield in fantasy, right now is Zeke and Pollard. I think at this point, Tony Pollard in two weeks has earned a spot in fantasy lineups as a flex play, as high as an RB2 play. Because believe it or not, guys, in half point PPR through two weeks, Tony Pollard is RB11. Whoa. And, oh. mind, you, and mind you, Zeke is RB24. So obviously we have disappointment on the Zeke side. I don't know about you guys. I'm not bailing on Zeke. Like, he still needs to be in your lineup. Uh, he's getting enough touches to be uh, a starting RB in fantasy. And he's, you know, the goal line work is what you're still hoping for. It, it doesn't happen all the time anymore, which is what has people worried. But, you know, you got to hope that Zeke finds the end zone every week. I I think I've been pretty vocal, especially to you guys, um, about how frustrating Pollard is. Um, but it is an interesting concept. And like you said, Chet, Pollard's RB11, and he's had a 7 and a 21-point game in, in half PPR leagues, or running back 11, excuse me. So I think we're in the middle of a little bit of a down RB season already. We've seen a lot of disappointment from people like Eckler and Gibson and Zeke. and um, But I definitely agree. Pollard is getting the work in – sorry about my dog. Uh, <laughs> I, I could – it's funny when I hear those noises, I'm like, is that Rex or is that a dog? <laughs> I don't know the Gaza's house. No, but Pollard I definitely think is earning his way into a lot of lineups. I don't think I'm ready to put him in an RB2 category yet, um, but I think he's an extremely viable flex option. I mean, game one he got four target, targets, caught all four. Last game he got three, caught all three, got a got goal three line touch touches. over Zeke. I don't see how you can't, if you have Pollard, have an opportunity to play him in the flex spot. So I definitely agree with that, that you can use him in the flex. And, guys, you know, what I see when I watch these games is when you're looking at a lot of these, you know, second string running backs, are they a third down back or are they getting entire series? And I feel like that's where it's shifted in Dallas right now is we're seeing Tony Pollard used on first and second down to give Zeke a breather. And that's what gets me excited as – Okay, this guy's no longer a handcuff, in my opinion. Those are two great points, and that's what you just said there, especially like the sample size. You look at two weeks, like, okay, we could go through a history of fantasy football players who had two good weeks and try to make careers out of it in their fantasy. But what you just said there, the use in the offense, the question in week one of Zeke, really, is he resting? Is it Mike McCarthy? Do they think the offense is better with two backs? A lot of that didn't make sense. And as you just both just said, the disappointing outputs of running backs if you've got RB11, you have to start him. You have to. Like, you have to put him in your lineup at that point because so many people from 19 to 32 are so eh every week. If Pollard's going to get goal line touches and put up yards, it doesn't matter. He has to be in your lineup. Before I move on to my number three duo, do you guys look at this as a good time to sell on a Tony Pollard? What a Maybe fun. if you have Tony Pollard without Zeke, this might be the best chance to reach out to a frustrated Zeke manager and be like, hey, sorry, Tony Pollard's been poaching on you, man. Do you want him? Yep. And maybe you can do a straight-up trade, a Tony Pollard for a wide receiver too. Yep. I think that's a viable trade that you could try to target with someone, especially with what we just talked about. RBs are not very successful right now. There's a lot of frustrated people that just want some consistency. You might be able to – it's only been two weeks, but we're reactive. We see some success. We want more of it. Uh, I might be leaning towards the, if I already have a good running back situation, 
and I was viewing Tony Pollard as a bye week guy, I might try to improve a different part of my team by trading him. All right, moving on to number three. Um, and this one's a big surprise for me. I think we talked about this in the group text. We might owe an apology to the Detroit Lions because they're a little bit better than we thought they would be, and Jared Goff in particular. Mm -hmm. But DeAndre Swift and uh, Jamal Williams. This is maybe even more surprising. DeAndre Swift right now is RB8. Williams RB16. Williams is a guy uh, for most of his career, if not all of his career, has been that annoying poaching running back on Aaron Jones. I mean, they started a hashtag free Aaron Jones because of this guy, but there's no denying he's getting a lot of work. That's almost a 50-50, maybe 60-40 in favor of DeAndre Swift. If I'm not mistaken, I think Williams is starting games. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can all agree DeAndre Swift is the more talented running back. He's more flashy, big play potential. But Jamal Williams is getting some work. He's getting goal line goal line looks. How do you guys feel about playing Jamal Williams at this point? I like Jamal Williams' personality. I know he had some great host uh, training camp interviews just talking about whatever. Yeah, they dumped me, but I'm ready to prove him wrong. Like Just very nonchalant about how the Packers threw him on the street, but he was ready to prove him wrong. As for that Lions team, who the hell made the schedule for Detroit? San Francisco week one. Green Bay week two, Baltimore week three, and it doesn't get much easier than that. Like they have multiple play. I think the Bills are on that schedule at some point as well, coming up in that first six week stretch. So with Detroit and all that, I just feel like they're going to get their butts kicked constantly and have to throw. So PPR leagues, yeah, half point PPR, full PPR. Golf's got to get the ball to somebody, and there's no Calvin Johnson, Kenny Galladay, TJ Hawkinson's being really good as a tight end right now. He's getting a lot of looks. So, yeah, especially second-half scoring from Swift and Williams, the Lions have this awful schedule that they're going to get buried in so many games. They're going to have to get the ball in somebody's hands in the fourth. Ironically, I am not high on Williams. And the only reason I say that I'm not high on him is because I remember hearing somewhere early in the preseason that they were really looking at Williams to spell um, Swift because of his injury. Mm -hmm. So as Swift continues to come back from that groin injury – what does the usage of him go go down? I don't think he's a, possibly a bad play maybe this week and possibly the next, but after that, you're going to be rolling the dice because that groin is going to start healing up. Um, with Swift getting 50 to 60% of the load, it's going to heal up at some point. And then it's, and we all can agree, Swift is the better back. Um, Williams has his flashes, but Swift is a, is a four-down back. He's really good. He proved it last year. He shows the flashes now. I'd be cautious on Williams. I wouldn't over I'll overvalue him over the next couple weeks. But similar, um, similar to the Pollard thing, do you try to get get rid of him for a, a wide receiver too right now to somebody who might not under might not know what's going on? Um, but that would be my biggest play. Is you got maybe a week or two left in Williams? Yeah, I kind of view him as like a, a great bye week fill in kind of guy. Like have him keep him. He has value. He's obviously getting some work. Um, he could be a great guy when you're. RB1, RB2 is on a buy. Have a guy like Jamal. This one's interesting, and it's actually funny in my notes. I was actually supposed to use this duo next, but I ignored the arrow, the big arrow that I made. Um, we're going to New England. Damian Harris and James White. Uh, different from these other guys that we've talked about, completely different roles on the team. And, and James White, for years, when he had Tom Brady, was the guy that catches a lot of passes out of the backfield. He almost should be listed as a wide receiver. He never gets the ball between the tackles. Um, I've seen a little bit of that this year, but it's still it's that similar kind of role where they get him, you know, design plays to go to James White. Uh, Damian Harris has been getting a ton of touches. I was worried after week one with his late red zone fumble. Was that going to hurt him against the Jets? No, he looked, he looked good. You know, he had that big touchdown run uh, where he carried half of the, the defense on his back. What do, you, what do you guys make of this Damian Harris, James White? Obviously, we, we think Damian Harris in most weeks is going to be ranked higher than James White. PPR formats, Wake, White gets a boost. But overall, what do you guys make of those two? Weirdly, I hate saying this. I don't hate either running back right now. Look at James White over the last two games, six, seven and six targets. He's yeah. only not caught one. He has 12 receptions. Like, getting 12 receptions, um, uh, 94 yards in two right. games. Then he also obviously had that short yard touchdown last week. 
So there, I think there's a lot of value in James White, especially with a young quarterback who needs to check down in an offense that is all about bang, bang, bang. Let's get it in and out. Um, when you see James White going on the field, you know he's going to get the ball. So I really like Harris. I like White. Harris, obviously, right now, RB1. White, solid flex, really good bye week RB. Um, and depending on the size of your league, he's an RB2 in some. So um, I actually really like the two-headed monster that's up there, um, especially because of the usage James White's getting. Ironically, they're RB18 and 19, with Woo. James White having the slight edge in half-point PPR. Two weeks of Patriot running backs playing well in fantasy will not convince me of the decades of avoid this, avoid this, get out of the way. Avoid. I'm not convinced yet. Here's one great piece of fantasy football advice. This is actually the best piece of advice I've gotten in the last three years of fantasy football, and I'm sad I couldn't share it in the summer because it happens in season. Uh, ESPN leagues have this sometimes. I know Yahoo for sure. It's one of the reasons people really like the leagues. You can go on game day and sort it by across Yahoo leagues who is the most added player within that day. So let's say it's like 1130 on a Sunday and you go look at who's the most added player. Most of the time it's going to be a kicker or a quick injury before. But Damian Harris was the most added player this past Sunday. Now all it really does for a lot of fantasy football managers is it gets in their head and they're like, uh, why is he being added? Why is he available? Why? How big is the lead? You start looking at some of this stuff and you're like, okay, what are these people who are picking up Damian Harris randomly off the waiver wire know that we don't know? And why is he not rostered already in most leagues? And then he has a huge game. And you're like, okay, something was out there. It's a great thing to keep an eye on if you're making late. I'm talking super late additions. Look who the most added players are on Yahoo in particular and just kind of pick up the vibe of what does somebody know 90 minutes before kickoff, and Harris was that guy last week. What what Yahoo leagues are people in that Damian Harris is on the waivers? I want, yeah. to be in that. I want to be in that league. God, I wish you could see our waiver. I mean, guys, you and I in the 14-team league, it is very slim pickings every waiver <laughs> wire. Um, last one on this, guys. Oh, I, one more thing about White that I think needs to be noted. He fell off pretty quickly with the departure when, when Tom Brady went to Tampa. I think in large part that has to do with just how bad the Patriots offense was with Cam Newton and just the design of that offense. And if I'm not mistaken, he had like a family tragedy that pulled him away from the team for a while. So it's like he, he kind of fell off our fantasy radar and it's amazing how quickly we can kind of just move on from a guy. I think we're getting reminded just how versatile he can be and they love him in new England. And so Kyle brings up the point, Six, seven, eight targets a game. I'll take that on my flex. Like that's production that you can almost count on every week from James White. So could, uh, his value is definitely returned this year. Could you imagine James White on the Chiefs? Just uh, how effective ooh, he is. I like, can't Clyde Edwards Hilaire be that. That's what I, I I think we thought that was what Clyde Edward Edwards Hilaire was going to be but <sighs> as an amount to it. Dude, if James White was on that Chiefs offense, that that running back dynamic gives them a whole nother. You just made me sad, Kyle. Um, last one, and the, the finding a fifth duo. I don't know why. I just I felt like I had to get to five because stopping at four just seems weird and awkward. <laughs> uh, so the fifth one, and and you guys, you guys might have a better fifth one because there are a couple options. I went with Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines. Um, neither one has been particularly good. Um, I just like the players. Um, I'm higher on Jonathan Taylor. Than I think both of you guys were this year. Uh, Naeem Hines, I, I'm expecting more from. I think they're gonna they're gonna get him involved, kind of like a James White. They're gonna get him more targets, get him in space. They just gave him a surprisingly big contract, so like they like him. I like him. Use him more. He's a guy where I think don't put him in your lineups. Hold on, hold on to Naeem Hines because he's one of those guys. If Taylor gets hurt and misses a game, Naeem Hines goes and becomes a top twenty play with Jonathan Taylor. Borderline flex if you if you really need one. And PPR, again, uh, more favorable, uh, but a really solid bye week guy. He's going to pop off for certain games. He's going to have a big touchdown run on a screen pass or something like that, and everyone's going to go, why didn't I start Naeem Mines? Don't feel bad, but hold on to him. He is a valuable running back. I definitely agree you should hold on to him. The only thing that worries me is what we saw in game one from Jonathan Taylor, which shocked me with the usage of Taylor in the passing game. 
Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, I just pulled it up. Seven targets, six catches for 60 yards. Like, that was what Naeem Hines was doing all last year. Jonathan Taylor wasn't getting that work. So, right. um, I agree. I think Naeem Hines is definitely worth holding on to. He's probably one of the better um, – uh, Handcuff? Like, yeah, handcuff in the league. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word at the moment. Right. So definitely like like that idea with him. Other guys that like popped into my head, you know, you look at the Raiders situation um, with Jacobs and Kenyon Drake. Um, I feel like that's going to be like whichever one's healthy and playing, you know, I, I feel more comfortable. With. I don't feel com- – if they're both healthy, I lean Jacobs and I don't think Kenyon Drake – I don't know. I don't, I don't love that situation as much. Maybe you guys like that one better. But Thank you for bringing up the Drake portion of it because I did see something where – Every two minute, Jacobs hasn't been on the field. Kenyon Drake's been on the field, so Jacobs is not getting two minute work. It's all oh, two minutes. I got you. well. Jacobs didn't play last week, so that's, I, that's part that of was it. from the week before. From week one, gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so I mean, I monitor that injury for Jacobs. If Jacobs can't play or is limited, I like Kenyon Drake. If Jacobs is going to be out there, meh. And the other one, um, Chase Edmonds, James Conner in Arizona. I just, I, you guys know how I feel about James Conner. Mm-hmm. Great guy, great story. I just don't think he's a great football player. I really don't. I think he's a one directional guy who can't break any a lot of tackles anymore. So I, I think Edmonds is far superior. That's going to annoy me for most of the season is if Chase Edmonds doesn't get the touches he deserves because I think he's just way more explosive at this point in his career. All those things are, I'll use the term, cloudy in those backfields because you have Kyler Murray who can make so many plays. Yep. The Colts yep. have a quarterback with two sprained ankles. So you don't know what the hell's I, I, going I, I, on. Bring that up, guys. How is he even walking? <laughs> it, Kyle's probably the only person I know who could also be walking because his ankles are made out of rubber at this point. Like they literally fold in different weird ways. Dude, that replay, guys, I'd be done for life. Like <laughs> in a wheelchair, I'm not walking again. I'm not risking that pain again. Like, oh my God. How do you recover? Like, what's the PT no. work for double sprained ankles? Trust me, you don't. They Dude, never get better. Do we like how bad do we feel for that guy? Like he just gets, and maybe it's his style. He holds on to the ball too long or puts himself in these horrible. He just gets crushed every week. And I'm starting to think it's more the way he plays. Like you gotta, you gotta make some quick decisions, man. Or 300 pounders are gonna break your ankles. Yeah, I know the Colts were dealing with some injuries up front, but like that's not a good enough excuse. Like you've been in the NFL for a while, man. Like you got it. This has been his whole career, besides that one quick long stretch where he was basically the MVP before he got hurt. That's this has been Carson Wentz in the majority more than the minority of his career. Exactly. Uh, it, it leads to this great thing that's coming up here, which is the biggest disappointments, whether it's your own individual teams, whether it's an individual play. We're going to get to that first, but we know fantasy football can be an up and down battle, a back and forth, a, a low, uh, you know, a, a road less travel, let's just say. It can be a load on your back, but when you have those tough things happening, luckily you have Mohawk Honda. Mohawk Honda is your place this fall to find your new vehicle. Unlike a fantasy football team where you just can't dump the entire team and get a new one, you can do that with your vehicle at Mohawk Honda. Take advantage of the Kentley Blue Book offer going on right now where you can stop at a Mohawk Honda right there on Freeman Bridge Road, the Glenville spot. I missed that on three podcasts this week, and I went slow. Freeman's Bridge Road. Almost went 0 for 4. Biggest disappointment. God's doing the read. But Mohawk Honda, I know it's not a disappointment for me because my pilot's sitting in my driveway right now. The best vehicle I've ever had in my life. Say what's up to our friends in Mohawk Honda when you make the drive wherever you live in upstate New York, right there in Glenville. Say hello to Greg Johnson. Ask for him. Cam McKenna recently married. Not sure if one of his best men showed up also in a brine stress for that wedding. I'll have to ask Cam and see what it does all about vip man hot sauce all those guys in there helping you find the vehicle that you want this fall it is mohawk honda where they always go out of their way to please you all right let's talk biggest disappointment guys i want to open up with two because they're both on the same team kyle i'm going to start with you aj brown slash julio jones huge disappointments are they more disappointing than the Kyle Ray fantasy football team? Double question for you out of the gates, because before I hit that red button that says record, you seem to be not very happy with your squad so far. No. So um, from the AJ Brown and Julio Jones perspective, it is definitely interesting because I think we all thought that that offense was going to be insane. 
Julio Jones, Derek Henry, AJ Brown. The only thing that they lacked was a potential tight end. They have a good tight end there who's kind of popping off a little bit. Offensive line has had some struggles blocking. Ryan Tannehill has looked awful. So I, th- I think the crazy part is AJ Brown still get, ha- I think he's still getting tons of targets. He's not catching the ball. It's not coming to him. Like game one, you're like, okay, I can deal with a, me- a mediocre 13, 14 point game. But then he throws up a six point game last week. Like it has got to be so frustrating. And I'm big on him. Like I love AJ Brown. I love the style he plays with. And he just wants to bully ball you and then he'll outrun you. Um, and then obviously the Julio side, we know the talent the guy's got. He's healthy and he's just not getting the ball. So I definitely think it's a big disappointment. I'm not ready to push the panic button though on that team or those two at all. I think as they start establishing their own game, um, as they hopefully start incorporating more play action pass, um, we can see stuff going. I think that was a big change was, when they lost their offensive coordinator from last year, uh, their their offensive scheme ended up being more drop back and then run, not run, 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 play action pass. I'm just going to beat you now. So I think if 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 they can figure out the play action pass, get that rolling, you get Derrick Henry rolling, then then you're going to be in great shape from that side. Yeah, I'm not um, like we were doing the. I forget if Goss teased it up as the stay. What we do stay. Bench drop. bench drop. Hey, look at you having it ready to go. Yeah. That's my guy. Yeah, so if we do stay bench drop, I'm staying on both of them. Um, clearly, we could see in week two, after Tannehill and Julio were not on the same page, there was more of an emphasis. Let's get Julio and Tannehill going. Uh, six catches on eight targets, 128 yards, didn't find the end zone. Um, that's the tough part is when the Titans get within the 10 to 5, we all know where the ball is going to go, mm-hmm. and uh, it's going to Derrick Henry. So that's going to be frustrating where you really have to score these these big touchdowns, which for A.J. Brown's career to this point, the phenomenal one, we've seen those huge chunk plays for 50, 60 yards. Hasn't happened yet. I'd say pump the brakes. Um, we know what those guys can do. Hopefully they can figure it out sooner than later. Kyle brings up the point of the offensive line. I think a lot of it goes to that where Tannehill's getting just – crushed and you're facing third and long and it becomes a lot tougher to fool the defense when you're facing those situations so um for those guys i'm going to say stay on both of them and uh just hope that they can figure it out and i think i think they will the the talent's there um i like mike vrabel i think they're going to figure it out and better days ahead for the titans offense as a whole the problem with A.J. Brown and julio jones we mentioned this one of our pre-season shows julio was just getting older and like Production wise, not fantasy wise, he actually looks okay. Like he made a big catch over the middle in that game. You're like, okay, Julio's back. You start looking statistically, which matters on this podcast. You're like, yeah, that's not the Julio Jones we know. As for AJ Brown, I was in a spot one of my drafts this year where I was between AJ Brown and Justin Jefferson. And people like you guys had known how much I love AJ Brown, the nickname the phenomenal one. I had a, a, a huge playoff game that year with them. Every year was doing something big with A.J. Brown. But I took Justin Jefferson over A.J. Brown this season because of the question with Julio Jones and Tannehill. And if Derrick Henry was going to eat targets, I'd get Dalvin Cooks on the Vikings. But I was excited to see what year two of Jefferson could be. As for the breakouts, yeah, look, A.J. Brown's going to have a big game. Don't freak out yet about him. Like you said, pump the brakes. No need to freak out about those guys. But this decision was probably made for you on draft day. Like you might have been between – Brown, Medcalf, Jefferson. I'm sure there's one other one that could be tossed in that mix there. Keenan was kind of in that realm as sure, well. Yeah. Allen. Yep. All those yeah, guys were in there. I, I face that as someone in the in the 10 leagues. That was a frequent if you were in that spot and you wanted to get a receiver, you kind of felt good about all of them, but you did have to start deciding which guy you like more. I think we actually, I don't know if it was in our in our group text or on one of these podcasts. I think I frequently put A.J. Brown at number three on that list. I liked Jefferson and D.K., which D.K. also has been a disappointment at this point, but um, slight edges over A.J. Brown because of the Julio factor. I also think with a guy like Jefferson, I just like his route running a little bit better. You know, I feel like he's a more crisp receiver where A.J. Brown relies on that huge play where I think you might get some higher reception games from Jefferson. What about Clyde Edwards-Hewlair, which we mentioned a little bit earlier 
Uh, both of you made a great reaction. So whoever wants to go first is fine here. What do we, we make about CHE? Can you, can you add a divorce option? I want, <laughs> I, want, I want a divorce. I want an annulment. I want to be able to redo my pick. No. Um, oh, you don't drop him. No way you drop a guy like CEH. But you're starting to flirt with the conversation of benching. Um, it's going to be on a complete team-by-team -team basis. Don't bench CEH without another option. Like, And depending on your league, there's probably not a lot of better options, so you're stuck. Um, but with some of those guys that we mentioned, like I'm playing Tony Pollard over CEH. I might play James White over CEH. Like Those guys that might have been on your bench as backup plans or bye week guys, you're getting nothing out of CEH right now. And it's not like they're the worst matchups. And this has now become a season plus of disappointment. I, I, I convinced myself that it was going to be an improvement this year, just on the track history of, of Andy Reed and producing stud running backs. G guys, help me explain how a team with Tyreek Hill on the outside and Travis Kelsey over the middle cannot get some gaps for the running back or get him in the flat. Please explain to me, like, are these defenses getting an extra two defenders that we're not aware of? How is that happening? You have the best quarterback in football. How are they not getting running lanes when you have the best passing game in, in football? Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy. And the, and the, and the best thing I love, I think, all the other running backs have combined for under 10 carries total. So you're looking at a, a, a backfield that is dominated by CEH. There ain't no second back. It's right. CEH. Well, then the worst part about it is Daryl gets the goal line work. So Daryl yeah. Williams is going to poach the one yard touchdown. It's just even, that's probably the worst fantasy football situation you can imagine because that guy's not valuable to play, but he's stealing the value of the, your starter. It's the worst situation you can be in. If you want to look at a silver lining, you got to look at the two defenses he has played. The, the Browns, who I think have a phenomenal defensive line um, and are going to stop the run, and then the Ravens are always a great run defense, and Patrick was forced to throw. Um, it doesn't get much easier over the next four weeks, though. you got the Chargers, who have proven pretty good against the run. The Eagles have a nasty front four. The Bills have been dominant on the run side, and Washington is obviously a good defense. starts to open up a little bit. Um, but I agree. Don't panic. You might. I'm panicking. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think we're in panic mode. I definitely think though you need to look at your options and say right. you might be on the bench based on matchups. Get me to the second half of the year, and I feel better when you play teams like the Titans, the Giants, the Packers, the the Raiders, the Cowboys. You know those should help some of those games. But again, you might be in for another couple rough weeks. Um, and don't ex don't be surprised if you see some shitty trade offers coming your way for Ceh. <laughs> Maybe maybe he was never the guy. You know, maybe they just shouldn't have drafted him because in that same draft class you had J.K. Dobbins and Jonathan Taylor, who were both better in college. And, Look, see, and Cam, Cam Akers? Cam Akers as well. I know those two in particular, Dobbins and Taylor, were just statistically better. Uh, Akers' numbers might have been right around there, but CHE was also on the LSU team that's going to go down as one of the great teams ever in college football history for how great that offense was. Maybe he just never was the guy. Because you, like you just said, Chet, like you've got everything you want, or maybe Andy Reid's to blame. Because the play calling is, I've got Patrick Mahomes and you don't. Why would I ever give anyone else the football after every snap? Sorry, like you're just not going to get the football because we want to give him the football because he's yeah, very, that, very good. That's the part when you watch these games. Like it's not like um, you know, Clyde's just not getting room to run. I don't know if it's like they're they're not getting creative on the run plays, but it's like. It's not like I'm watching it and I'm like, man, why couldn't he have broken that tackle? Or why could he's usually running into a gang of tacklers and he's just like, yeah, of course he's going to go down. Um, that's what frustrates me the most is we've seen how creative Andy Reid can be and usually is. It just doesn't seem like those creative plays go to Clyde. It, it goes to Tyreek, it goes to Kelsey. And then, yeah, let's just keep the defense honest with a dive. And it's like, he's not a dive running back. Like, that's not how he was utilized at LSU. I think that's why we were so excited when they drafted him because it seemed like the perfect schematic fit 
a guy who caught passes from Joe Burrow and they used in space. That's what the Chiefs offense does. And that's what I thought we were getting so far. Uh, prayers to anybody that is relying on CEH. One more for you guys here in the state bench drop. It's another tough one. Another running back with high expectations, formerly the first round. Saquon Barkley. How do we handle the Saquon Barkley situation with the Giants? If you want, I will go first because I've got Saquon in the league. Okay. And we mentioned in last week's start sit him. We said bench Saquon because I didn't think he'd be good enough. Now, he got off a nice run against Washington, but One fantasy run. football-wise, that's exactly it. You start looking at everybody else across the running back spots in fantasy football, that's not good enough to say that should have been a start for most, most leagues. Did he rush back? I know he's like a genetic freak, but he just looks like he's favoring his leg, and he's not the same Saquon Barkley we saw at Penn State early in his rookie season. And the other element to add is, is Saquon thinking about his next contract? Because this is the really tough part about running backs, where if you know you're coming off an injury and you don't look good going into a contract year, especially one more time at running back, Teams are not going to line up to pay an injured running back who is already banged up and it, like it's not going to happen. So I fear that maybe Saquon has his eyes too much on the 2022 offseason and even this season. We've seen running backs hold out and do different things. Boy, I, I feel like each week he's moved from running back one to running back two to flex. Like I don't know if he's in the conversation as a top two running back consistently week in and week out until he can show me he's – the same as Saquon we've seen previously in his career. I am not quite yet ready to hit panic button. And the only reason I say that is usage last week. This week is going to be very telling for Saquon. You go against a bad Atlanta defense. If you can keep the same usage up and just show me a little bit of the flashes, get me a touchdown, get 80 yards, hold on, like be in the game for 90% of the snaps, I'm happy. I think he was in the, in the game 82% of the snaps last week. Um, I'm not ready to panic button. I will be keeping him because I have him in one of my other leagues. He will be in my RB1 spot. Um, but this week's going to tell a lot. Um, I think if he has another bad week, you need to look at moving on from Saquon. You need to try to ex uh, explore some trades. Um, but it's everything, in my opinion, for Saquon rides on this week. I think he has the ability to put up a 15, 20 point game. But if he throws up a 10 and below, I'm going to probably hit the panic button on Saquon. Yeah. I tend to agree on that. I think I was actually, you know, like Gaz mentioned, we we said sit him last week, and if you did, you're welcome. Um, but he actually got more usage in that game than I thought he would mm -hmm. after it being a short week, playing on Thursday, uh, coming off the injury. I thought we would have seen less, but he got more. Then he had that run. There was that glimpse of that Saquon. So with the extra couple days after playing Thursday to get rested, to get healed, a great matchup. I say this is the week you go in. And, it, and if you look dumb, you look dumb. But um, I, I usually I'm one of the guys I side on. I want to be a week late as a week early. At this point, you need it. You're going to need your top, your top pick to perform. And, again, fingers crossed this is the week that he does it for you. Before we get to some of our favorite starts and sits for week three, we got to hit our John Stone Supply in Troy Mailbag. We've got one question this week. Thanks to our friends, John Stone Supply in Troy. The fall weather is officially here. What does that mean for your home? That means your heating system needs to be updated. Your furnace, is it heating up in your home? Well, maybe it is, or maybe it's not going the right way. John Stone Supply in Troy can help you figure out exactly what you need. Give them a call. Check them out on 6th Avenue and more. They want to make sure your home is ready to go for this fall. Whether it's that furnace update, whether you need your filters changed and more, they are going to be the company you want to work for to have that all happen for you. 6th Avenue in Troy. Say what's up to my guy, Tom. My guy, George, has got a new knee. He's got better knees soon enough than Saquon Barkley, all right? George is more banged up than Carson Wentz. Help the guy out. Say what's up to him. John Stone Supply in Troy. For more information, check him out on Facebook as well. We're tagging them, and if you're watching on our visual sign, you've got all their information below throughout the entire show. So there you go. Johnstone Supply and Troy. If you want to write into the show, our Twitter handles as well are shared on social media and more. So Chet, Kyle, Gaz, whoever you want to reach out to for a question, we'll be more than happy to share that on the show. We're going to go with Mark 
W. Shout out to New England. This one's coming from Connecticut. Mark W. in Connecticut wants this question answered by us, guys. Can Rob Gronkowski keep up this pace? Now, I think I need to rephrase this for Mark, and I always feel like I just like change everybody's questions out of the mailbag every week. That's the new tradition. Gaz will say the question how he wants to say it for Mark W. in Connecticut. I think he means top five tight end because right now he's two. So this pace, I would say no, unless you guys disagree with this. But if no, you tell me top five tight end, I think he can do that. I think he will score 34 touchdowns. I think this is going to be the greatest season in football history. Um, do I think he can keep a top five? I'll say yes to top five. I think that's right around the sweet spot. Um, if you got him late in your draft or maybe he was your number one waiver pick, uh, that is so rare. To I mean, Darren Waller a couple of years ago was a guy – and somewhat – no-name guy that came in and had a huge season. Obviously, Rob Gronkowski is not a no-name, but you know he's old. You know, I, I thought he, I thought he was for sure going to retire after winning a Super Bowl after coming out of retirement. But he's just got the connection with Brady. Brady trusts him. Like he looks for him in the red zone. He's getting this number one option in the red zone to Gronk. And sure, Cameron Braid's still there. OJ Howard is getting in the mix again, so that worries me a little bit for if he can keep up this pace. But with how disappointing other tight ends have been, namely George Kittle and Mark Andrews, why not? Give me a Gronk touchdown every other week. I think uh, you're going to feel really good keeping him in your lineup. And uh, congratulations on getting a steal of the 2021 draft. Yeah, I think he can keep the pace of a top five. I don't think he's going to, to Chet's point, score 34 touchdowns. <laughs> Come on. What? Um, Honest question, not to interrupt you, Kyle. Yeah. Even though I just totally did. Uh, do we think Brady can break the passing record this year? With this, Granted, he gets an extra game. With his weapons, yeah. I mean, that, is, he that. To, is he up to nine touchdowns? Can he? Yes. Will he? No. I mean, that's, he, he can't in his mid-40s, right? He can't do that. Gods, what's the stat? He's about more touchdown in his 40s than his 20s. 20s, that's right, yeah. yeah I mean, come yeah. on. All right, continue, Kyle. So the thing that is crazy about Gronk, and it's funny because ironically, there's one wide receiver on his own team that's higher in the red zone. Gronk's four for four in the red zone. Uh, four catches, four targets, four touchdowns. Ironically, Chris Godwin has more uh, targets in the red zone. He has six targets in the red zone over Evans and Gronk. That is not what I thought would happen. But anyways, um, Gronk's <laughs> Gronk just gets those targets from TV. I mean, Gronk has a total of... Uh, 12 targets, so you're telling me 33% of his targets are in the red zone. I don't hate the play. You know he's going to get a couple looks from Brady every week. I think he keeps it up. I think he'll probably finish top three. I'm thinking Kelsey, Waller, Gronk. I really am. Oof. Oof. I'm not that high. I mean, I wish I was, but I'm going to say <laughs> – uh, we joke. Um, I'm going to say top five. I'm going to say like right at – Five. I think Kittle figures it out. I think Hawkinson's four. Gronk five. That was, that was I, I did forget about Hawk. Nowhere. <laughs> Kyle Pitts is nowhere in sight. Unfortunately, no. Aaron <laughs> Jones, good pick. Kyle Pitts so far, not as good as a pick. <laughs> All right, let's get into our starts and sits. And for well, whatever you, reason, you didn't answer no, the what? question, guys. Oh, I say yeah. I think Gronk oh, yeah. is. I think so. I would say I think your your list right there of Kelsey and Waller still one two is right. Hockey in the mix is three. Then you're fighting it out for that four and five. I think it speaks more to – we talked about running back struggling. Like the tight end thing's a mess. And we knew going in, like that's just how this position is. It's going to be a mess. So even though Gronk's been good for like the first two weeks, there's a chance if he's like below average, he might be in the top 11 by like mid-October because of the tight end position is just so wild. So, yeah, I would – as a Buck fan, I hope he's number one, to be honest. <laughs> I, I hope he keeps the pace. <laughs> I think so bad that his four touchdown start will keep him in the top five for the next month. Like yes. he could go over and he's going to be listed as tight end six or something. Like that's sure. how long it takes guys to accumulate those kind of points. There was a Tyler Higby game, I think it was two years ago, where he had the remember that like the three touchdown 180 yeah. game. And he became like tight end 17 to like seven in yeah. one week. Right. It's crazy, man. All right. Starts and sits. 
So we're talking about people who may consistently be in your lineup that you're like, hang on, pull back a little bit, or you're looking at some type of matchup this week and you're saying start them as soon as possible. Uh, like I've joked around throughout this entire already regular season, jump around where you want. You want to start with a wide receiver because he jumps out on your notes? Great. You want to go running back? Wonderful. This is more like confidence to least confidence is how we've somehow gone to this. Or maybe that's just me and I just have a weird brain and weird notes that I write down show after show. By the way, I put my notes down on one of these tabs. And then when I went to the tab, it was the picture of Kyle in the wedding dress, like right in my face, high <laughs> definition, zoomed in like this, trying to read my notes. Okay. Anyways, uh, I've got a ton going on at quarterback this week. Ton. Oh, great, because I don't. So you yeah. go. So I've got three quarterbacks that I want to find ways in. Three. Three. I've got oh Tom Brady, Matthew Stafford, and Sam Darnold. So Tom Brady's listed as the ninth best quarterback this week. You just heard all the numbers we just ran through. How the hell is he going to play this SoFi Stadium at a 425 kickoff when I feel like it's going to be a shootout between the Bucks and the Rams? Bruce Arians doesn't want to run the ball. Sean McVay doesn't want to run the ball. Stafford's 11. Tampa's 9. Even the Atlanta Falcons are putting up points against them last week. I like both Brady and Stafford for both of them to be in the top five this week. And Sam Darnold. Sam Darnold gets Houston on a short week. You want to talk about coaching. Matt Rule and Joe Brady. Sam Darnold does not even look like the same person who played for the New York Jets for the past few seasons. The Panthers are 2-0. They're pacing for 3 now. And Darnold's sitting anywhere between 18 and 20th best quarterback. They're just going to let him throw. Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. Darnold has the possibility of finishing in the top 10 with a great matchup against Houston. I like all three of those guys. Brainy, Stafford, and Darnold. And you know what? I'll tell you my sit, too. Justin Fields. Yeah. Justin Fields. All the rookies have been so bad the first two weeks of the season. And this was supposed to be the moment where Justin Fields comes out and shows everybody what he can do and be better than Dalton. He wasn't good. He gets Cleveland, and the Browns can do both offense and defense to slow down people. I say offense because their offensive line, they just eat up the clock. So I don't like Fields. I thought I was going to love him this year, but I don't – Love that matchup against Cleveland this week. Can we do it? Can we do a, our first official beer bet? Yes. What is it? I think Justin Fields gets twenty points or more. Ooh, I'll take that one all day. I, I will. Bet you, I bet you three quarters of it comes from his legs. I will put that down somewhere. Write it down. First beer I'm bet. It out. I'm leaving Shed it right next to my computer, so I'll see it next week and remember. Nineteen point nine over under for a beer. <laughs> nice at Hooters. Yes. Nice. <laughs> All right. That's, I didn't have anything else for quarterbacks. I find that interesting. So Sam Darnold, do you think he's going to be top 10? Ooh, I'm going to think. I'm going to go check my waiver wires real quick. And if, if I'm wrong, you owe me multiple beers. Or if you're wrong, I should say. Ooh, so the double beer bet then. The double be, even at the end. I'm going to turn this into a parlay of beer. That's right. Yeah. It could be a wash at some point. <laughs> um. uh, Go ahead, Kyle. No, go ahead, guys. I, I had nothing. I was saying with Chad, I had nothing else to add with quarterbacks. I mean, the only other quarterback that I could consider looking at right now is just Derek Carr for the amount of, that they're letting him sling the ball. Um, especially if uh, Jacobs is out again, Derek Carr might be worth taking a peek at the ad going against Miami, um, who didn't have a great game um, overall. So, especially if there's no Brissett, who that defense might be on the field a lot. I don't think I worry about is just monitor that injury. Yes, that, uh, that car had. Make sure, make sure he's good to go. Uh, the one player I would say sit for running back here this week. It's not too quick to give up on Eli Mitchell, is it? Like we all loved him, thought he'd be the number one. Oh. We all just dump him after one week. Go ahead. You didn't like him, chat, right? I Kyle did didn't not. like him. I, I, told, I should say I this. Told everyone to chill, and you should have chilled. Yes, but keep going. No, I, I, was didn't, say- I didn't predict an injury. That that part. God, the San Francisco 49ers are cursed. Would they lose three more? Yeah. Oh, well, so sounds like two might miss, Hasty and uh, Sermon. But it sounds like Mitchell might be able to play. But ugh, after a dud of a game and now he's coming in with a bang, banged up shoulder. I heard somewhere that you know, this could be a game where you see them get real creative and Debo Samuel gets a few carries, some jet sweeps, some Brandon Ayuk sweeps. Like they're going to manufacture – running plays with guys you might not expect. But yeah, I, I say 
hold off, hold off on Mitchell. I thought about this with Mitchell too. And I used the we like the old podcast, radio, television, we of you listening who we can't see right now because he was the most added player. I mentioned Damian Harris is the most Sunday added player. Eli Mitchell is the most added player. So that's right. You listen to We Talk Fantasy. We told you guys. And now we all realize he stinks. And that's on you <laughs> for figuring that out. Uh, the only other one I'm really concerned about is Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon was so good week one. I am renaming the Denver Broncos the Denver Boredoms. My God. That team is going to be 3-0 when they beat the Jets. And there is nothing I'd want to do less than watch Denver Bronco football. You want to know hey, boring? Like- I and I are going to watch them in person this year. No. Are are you? We're going to do a Dallas Cowboys-Denver Broncos game in Dallas. Bring some sunglasses and a lot of alcohol because that (laughs) style of football that Vic Fangio is playing is brutal to watch. You want to talk about not a lot of production? Although, Teddy Bridgewater, secretly, silently, over 300 yards, couple touchdowns. I just don't get what Bronco football is going to be this year, so I would just – for the sake of your sanity, not watch Broncos Jets, unless it's airing on CBS 6, because then you should definitely tune in. It definitely totally is airing on CBS 6. Like I said, I love the Broncos. It's a great team. (laughs) Tune in. You can't miss that action coming on CBS 6. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. Um, My only hate at the running back position, uh, Josh Jacobs. He's a guy questionable, monitor it. I don't even know if he is going to play. If he does end up suiting up, I'm not playing them. I hope that you have a better option. Uh, we saw how painful, how much pain he was in with that toe ankle injury. Where like you, you tell he's a tough guy because he would go in, he'd run, and then limp off the field, and then five plays go by, and he comes back in, repeat. And so when it's an injury that is to your lower body, like it's what the running back needs. Like if he can't be explosive on that leg. What are, what are we going to get from Josh Jacobs? And they have Kenyon Drake, and it's a long season, and they're 2-0. and Why would you rush him back and give him a lot of work if he's not 100%? So I'm out on Josh Jacobs this week. Uh, person I'm sitting that probably a lot of people have got in the second round is the biggest disappointment possibly that we're thinking, especially after the ETN injury, James Robinson. He is going straight to the bench playing the Arizona Cardinals. Um, I'll find a better option. I'll start Melvin Gordon over James Robinson. The thing that concerns me the most is how much Urban Meyer is saying, hey, uh, Trevor Lawrence, go break the interception record. Go go ahead. Go do it. I don't get it. You have a stud back. You're, not, you're literally telling Lawrence, throw it on 70% of the plays, and everybody knows it's coming. And then we'll give, the, we'll give Robinson a couple touches here and there. Robinson will be on my bench. He's uh, he's in timeout um, until I see different. I will find better options. I will figure it out. But I watch. I watched a little bit of the Jags game uh, last week, and I couldn't stand the situations that they were putting Lawrence in and the inability to use him. So peace out. You on the bench until you can prove me. To, you can tell me differently. There's this, this hilarious image of my mind, how funny it would have been if this is allowed someday in the future where fantasy football managers like us can show up to practice and tell the players, hey, you're going to time out, okay? <laughs> you're not playing well enough. You're sitting right over there until you're allowed to be back. <laughs> There's just something hysterical. The, the Pop Warner thought process of if you're not performing, we're going to show up to practice and sit you is too funny. God, I'm picturing, I'm picturing the, uh, the guys from the league doing something like that. Yeah, right. There it is. <laughs> there it Top is. Starting over James Robinson, just in case y'all were wondering. Do it. You know what, Kyle? I want to steal your exact style right there, and I'm going to do one of these. I just, you know what? I just botched it. I just said I was going to do it. Okay, you can't see it as well on mine because I have just terrible lighting with no ring light here. What a professional I am. I just swapped Kenny Galladay and Michael Pittman Jr. I had Michael Pittman Jr. in my lineup for the Godzilla Media League. The Titans have given up the most fantasy football points this season of wide receivers. And I bring up that stat. I know the sample size is two weeks. That one might not change because the Titan defense has been bad for a few years now. It's costing them wins, and the fans in Tennessee know that. Kenny Galladay, really good in Detroit. We're going to find out real fast if it's just garbage time, touchdowns, and yardage and all that. 
Matthew Stafford, or he's actually a legit, really good wide receiver. It was worth it for the Giants. We've already mentioned it on this podcast. For God's sakes, New York, can you figure this one out? Can you beat Atlanta? Daniel Jones, you were really good on Thursday. You didn't win, but you were good. This is your game. Come on. No Saquon potentially still rehabbing. I say no quant, no Saquon in the sense of not the player we're used to. Kenny Galladay, one time. I just put you in the starting lineup. Don't blow the game for me. One time. Which, by the way, Sterling Shepard has been a pleasant surprise. Really he's good. Single guy, digit. Uh, yeah, he's got. A, I think everyone had a shot at him on the waiver wire, and if you uh, if you got him, he's, he's gonna be hard to t- keep out of your lineup with how much he's been producing. Uh, wide receiver that. Uh, Man, has he been freaking good this year. Mike Williams, what a target share. 22 targets in his, his two games. Five of them have come in the red zone. It, it's becoming a theme when, you, when I make these picks. Do you guys know who the Chargers are playing? The I want to say the Steelers, but it's not the Steelers. Who are, who are, who are the guys I like playing against this team? The Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, yes, they are playing the Chiefs. Yeah, six Chargers yep. are going to have to keep up. And Justin Herbert loves Mike Williams. He's one of those guys, similar to why I made the point about Debo Samuel, play him while he's healthy. Play him while he's healthy. That guy tends to get hurt a lot because he goes up for these acrobatic catches and lands on his back. That was your pick too, Kyle? No. Oh, yeah, I think Mike Williams, uh, he's projected 12.2. Um I think he's going to have another big game because he's getting a lot of looks in the red zone. They're airing it out to him. It's everything you want in a fantasy receiver. He's got the air yards. He's got the red zone work. He's got the target share. There's no denying it, man. Mike Williams uh, is, a, is a pretty legit player right now. Um, I'll take this moment to use my apology here. Um, oh, on, I, uh, Palmer? I still have two weeks because I said it by <laughs> week four. Uh, but, yeah, Mike Williams, you uh, – you make me look stupid, bud. Um, <laughs> so, Mike, I'm sorry. For once, you're not getting injured. Um, and you're doing a really good job. So, stop. So, Jordan Palmer can get in there. Thanks, bud. Um, <laughs> but my um, my actually start this week, and I'm I'm really struggling to find a way to get him in my lineup, unfortunately. Um, a, a start that I'm going to say is probably not as most common one is Cortland Sutton. Start him. He was a target machine last week with 12 targets. Uh, no Judy, you continue to start Sutton. Probably not the hottest take, but make sure he's in your lineup. Um, one that I'm trying to figure out how to get into my lineup, Quintez Cephas. Very pleasant surprise for the, for the Lions. Baltimore has given up a lot of air yards. I know it was the Raiders and the Chiefs, but they've given up a lot to the, in, on the air. I think the Lions are going to have to throw to try to stay in the ball game. Quintez Sivas has been a very pleasant surprise for the Lions. 14 total targets. Now, granted, he only has seven catches. Um, first game, the, the touchdown saving, but but the other last uh, last Sunday's game was really nice. Or last Monday night's game, 63 and a touchdown. Um, if you can find a way to work him into the flex, I say get him. I think he's going to continue to have really solid production. Him and um, – him and Goff are looking very well together, so I am getting hot on Cephas, and I really am trying to figure out a way to get him in my lineup this week. Is that your waiver pickup of the week? Yes. Cephas? Quintez Cephas. I tried to get him in majority of my leagues. Um, I, like I just actually grabbed him in the in the uh, Coliseum, and I'm unfortunately I don't feel good about dropping anybody in my in the dynasty league, so it's hard for me to figure out who I'm going to work there. But if you have a spot that you're like iffy about. Go get go get Cephas. I think he's going to be a consistent uh, option for the Lions. I love it, guys. It is twelve forty nine. We got. Oh, wait, wait. Have we have we hated on people yet? Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, I have more. No, I didn't. I didn't hate on anybody. Hate, 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 hate. Chet, go ahead and hate. Like the I haters club for the Chappelle show. Go ahead. Hate. It's yeah. like it's about to be one a.m. I'm getting cranky. Uh, let me hate on some people. I All hate. Right. Who do I hate? Wait a second. Hey. Oh, yeah, I hate Brandon hey. Cooks. He's played Sorry. great, Chet. He's played great the last he two weeks. He has been phenomenal. And every time he makes a big play, I go, ha, guys told you so. Guys knew he was going to have a good year. Who the hell is Davis Mills? <laughs> 
Dude, I I watch college football. Guys, I know you actually probably know who he is. Um, I had to Google it. I was like, who the hell is Davis Mills? And when I saw Stanford, it like kind of rung a bell. But it's a rookie making his first start in prime time. Carolina's defense is actually pretty good. Like I think people don't realize that. They're actually pretty solid. Uh I just don't like it. I don't I don't know what we're gonna get. I don't like an unknown. So as tough as it is to not ride the hot hand of Brandon Cooks, who's been great, I don't like it. I don't like it. I I I don't feel confident that Davis Mills, I don't know what he can do. So that's where I that's where I'm at with uh with him. Davis Mills Scott report, he was supposed to be the next big thing at Stanford, like a five star can't miss prospect. And he was never good. Like he never was as good, but He's one of these high school kids that does everything right. So, I, sadly, I, I do like that pick. I also have one more hate for you, Chad. If you don't have any, or was that your? Slip on some more hate, raid. Do right. it, Miles Gaskin. Do yeah. not play him. Don't, 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 don't. Um, they are going to have to throw the ball. I think the ba- the Raiders are going to s- just hammer the box and say, "Jacoby, beat us with your three step drops." I mean, uh, hold on, I have him pulled up, Miles has a total of 14 carries on the season Ooh. and he is the lead back. <sighs> Gross. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the phone. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and everybody was so high on him because of the injuries yeah. and everything like that. Like, oh, he's the back. Well, guess what, guys? He ain't the back. No. The Dolphins offense is stinky. Another one last thing. So let's end on some love. Let's just love a little bit more in this world. Uh, I think Cordell Patterson might have a good game. Huh, I knew I was forgetting. Something. Three for Everybody. three. I picked him up in a league this week. I, I did as well, and I'm actually playing him in a league, I believe. Um, Cordell Patterson against the Giants. Mike Davis doesn't have the, the juju that he had on the Panthers, where he was so great filling in for CMC. Has it translated in Atlanta? And Cordell Patterson is just – Making big plays. He's getting used a lot. You love the – like, he's been that guy his whole career. He's been like that um, Swiss Army knife where you could use him in so many different positions. He doesn't He doesn't fit the mold of one position. But now that he's getting carries and red zone work, touchdowns against the Giants, I like it. Give me – maybe give me a, some Cordero Patterson. Can By the way, just to clarify, is he getting running back and wide receiver yeah. – for ESPN links, I know he is for Yahoo. Yep. Okay. Yep. He is, yeah, he is both. Yep. Can we also talk about how big that dude is and how fast he is? 6'2", 230, and is burning people. It doesn't make sense. Uh, he's, he's a weird specimen. You, you, you're you a safety coming downhill, and you see Cordell Patterson, you go the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, man. Every time I'd run away. Chet has got his hands up. He is good. Kyle is stretching. His hands are up. My hair is jacked up like Jimmy Neutron right now. I've looked at the baby monitor for the last 10 minutes. All Rex did was just roll around and make noises trying to end this. So before I have to head upstairs and before we catch in some fantasy football wins, clock it at 12.50 a.m. We talk fantasy after dark. That's the image we want to go with. A man going through the table. The Bills Mafia at the wedding. Boys, we'll catch you guys next week. See ya.